Thank you all. Thank you, Denise. I appreciate y'all having us. This is, I think, our third trip back. And as she said, we've got some folks that we know here and some folks that we know really well from here. So just appreciate y'all having us out. Hopefully you can see some of this, but I'm really informal when I talk. So I'm just putting stuff out there and we can talk and you can ask questions and, and we can go over all this. Uh, a couple things that we're talking about today are customized knee implants. This is what Denise has. This is what I've talked about uh, several times when we've been over this way. And then uh, I'm using a talk that we did a couple weeks ago where we're throwing in what I call some myth busters about total joint replacement. A little bit about me, I am fellowship trained in hip and knee replacement. So all orthopedic surgeons do five years of residency training after medical school. Some of us spend an extra year in fellowship doing very specific training in certain subspecialties. That can be hand, foot and ankle, spine, or in my case, joint replacement. There's, there's a reason for that. Uh, we have a lot of published evidence now that surgeons that specialize in these types of procedures get better outcomes and have lower complication rates. So what I always say when I talk about something like this is even if you know somebody in Virginia that's having a hip replacement, encourage them to seek out somebody that does specialize in that. Statistically, they're gonna have a better outcome. Um, talking about the conformist system, this is the only customized knee replacement on the market. And what this is, is an entirely unique implant for each individual patient. So if someone's undergoing a knee replacement, that device is made for only one patient in the world. What Denise got was Denise's knee. It doesn't go in anybody else. So the entire system is built around that principle. What's included in that are these fully patient specific devices, all of the instruments, that you see on this side of the screen are fully patient specific. They're actually 3D printed. They're used for that case and then they're disposed of. So we think of that as being pre-navigated. And what that means is in another scenario where we might use a robot or computer navigation or other technologies to try to be very accurate with what we're doing, we're using these pre-printed guides that are specific for that patient. So what we're doing is making the implant fit the patient instead of just making the patient fit whatever implants we have available as we do with more traditional setups. On the left, you can see, hard to tell from that distance, but all of these are not only sized differently, but they're shaped differently. I, I've put in several hundred of these devices and I can tell you that they really are all shapes and sizes and they all really do fit perfectly. This is just a, a model or a schematic of what some of that 3D imaging looks like. This process, and this slide's really dark so it's hard to see, is based off of a CT scan. So each patient's knee is scanned and a three-dimensional model of their anatomy is created. And that's what's used to personalize the knee and all of the instruments associated with it. That process does take about six weeks, so there's a little bit of lead time before surgery. We use that to get patients in for any medical clearances that they need, for pre-op therapy, for everything that we can do to optimize their outcome after surgery. But it does have a little, little bit of additional lead time sometimes before the procedure. This is what's called an eye view. It's basically a map that I get with each one of these devices that shows exactly how much bone is being removed at what level and exactly where all of these guides and instruments fit during surgery. And that's the whole system. It's about this big and it's a knee in a box. So that patient's specific knee, all the instruments that we need to do a custom surgery amongst all these barcodes on the outside are the surgeon's name and the patient's name. It only fits one patient in the world and everything is shipped, packed sterile and ready to go. So that's really cool. It's a neat technology. We're using 
robots and computers and 3D printing, why the heck would we want to do this, even though it seems really neat? Well, we want to improve outcomes. We want to make things better. I want my patients to move more, to bend more, to play golf, to play tennis, to do whatever it is that they want to do. So if I can get better at that, I want to do it. If I can make them recover faster, that's better. Everybody wants to get back to their life. Whatever it is that they enjoy doing, they want to be back to it sooner, not immobilized by surgery. And the other thing that sounds a lot like improving outcomes, but we want to lessen dissatisfaction. We've got this group of people out there, and it may be 10 or 20 percent, depending on what studies you read, that have a knee replacement, and they didn't have a complication. Their surgery went well. Their x-ray looks good. Their surgeon's pretty happy with it. They can move. They can walk. But it's just, it just doesn't feel right. It's not what they expected. They still have pain. And we want to get that group and make it better for them. We want to get them in that big group of patients that are really happy, that wish they had done their procedure five years before. So the system is intended to address some of the things that we know can go wrong. Sizing mismatches, an implant that hangs over the edge of the bone, something that's not straight, that's not stable, it doesn't move or bend like a normal knee, what we think of as, as kinematics. This is just a drawing of fit, and you can see on the left, bone that underhangs or an implant that hangs over the edge. An overhanging implant can cause pain as it rubs against soft tissues. But uncovered or exposed bone can bleed. It can cause swelling. It can cause a, a longer or more painful recovery. And then on the far right, you'll see an image of a patient-specific implant. Again, you could probably get a medical illustrator to draw this however you wanted. I mean, somebody would make this for us. But I'm telling you from having done a lot of these, they really do fit like that every single time because they're made for that patient. The shape of it follows not only the size of that patient's anatomy, but the normal curvature. And so it's shape matched to that patient's knee so that they have a knee that moves more naturally and feels more like it's their knee. This is a study from Dr. Will Kurtz in Nashville uh, about blood loss and swelling. Uh, this system was demonstrated to have less blood loss, less swelling after surgery, and actually to preserve bone. So it takes away less bone than a lot of conventional knee implant systems. It's a multi-center study with a lot of a little more complex terminology in some of it, but basically it demonstrated that this was more likely to result in a stable knee and a knee that moved in a manner that was more similar to a normal knee. Keeps moving around. Um, Multi-center study, faster times to all three functional activities that they measured versus traditional implants. So they got up and moved uh, faster, stair climbing, walking, functional activities. They were quicker to get back to them, so a quicker recovery and more likely to have a good outcome versus a conventional implant. So from there, I've, I've done some with more studies in it and a bunch of different things. In our talk a couple weeks ago, we started hitting on some what I call myth busters. So one, and somebody in here has heard this, I guarantee, because I hear it in my office every week, knee replacements only last 10 years. Who's heard it? Yep. Who, who believes it? I kind of I gave that one away. <laughs> the overwhelming majority are going to last more than 25 years. Even... Did they last that long? Uh, I, depends on how early you're talking about. Some, some of them, I think that was true, or it was close to being true. 
You are, but bear in mind too, the ones that we have this follow-up on have, are the ones that were going in 20 and 25 years ago. So even from that era, the far majority are lasting that long. In most of the studies, when you get past 20 years, 80 plus percent, 85 percent still in place and doing well. I picked that. This is from some recent data from one of the British registries. At 25 years, they had an 82 percent survivorship. So certainly, you know, hey, I mean, we can all do that math. 18% of them had had an issue or a complication, but the very great majority were still in place and doing well. And we hope that with newer designs like we've got now, that they're going to last even longer, that we've got better materials, that these very shape and size matched implants are going to distribute force as well. I'm aware of at least one study. Uh, I think one of the New York groups had 30 year follow up. Obviously it's, it's hard to follow patients that far out uh, where they had 70% survivorship. So, so even the majority and even then with a very early design, not the earliest designs, uh, but, uh, but certainly some that have been around a while. So um, I have that conversation a lot with people that are, hey, I'm only 55, I'm only, you know, whatever. And they're telling me I'm going to have to have this redone again in 10 years if I have to do it. And so they're, they're very leery to think about that or want to go forward. To ask you with the knees, knee replacement, if you've been diagnosed with osteoporosis, with the bone loss, what happens if you have to have a knee replacement? Is that a... So typically nothing, because we do a lot of these in patients that do have osteoporosis. Your surgeon's gonna screen that a little bit just off of x-rays. I mean, even, you know, to, to have a true measure, we'd have to do a bone density test. But, but most of us that look at, you know, however many x-rays a day I see, have a sense when bone's thin or it's not. But basically we've got materials in surgery that let us accommodate for that. And so most of the time it doesn't change what happens during the procedure at all. There are some devices where you can add on some additional stems or do things to augment the device uh, in surgery. Down the line, will the knee, if you, if you have your osteoporosis, it's worse, will the knee still fit? It'll still fit because your bone doesn't change in size. It changes in its, its density. Um, and I would point out, there's a, a plug for our group here. We have a, uh, we have a dedicated osteoporosis clinic, bone density testing, we have a nurse practitioner that specializes in that because uh, there's a lot of newer drugs, not just the oral bisphosphonate therapies that, that we've given for years and years, but some IV infusions and other, um, other treatments uh, that are a little bit newer. And so we're pretty good, I think, especially when we see patients that have had fractures or that, you know, to your point, if I look at your x-ray and go, gosh, your bone's a little thin, or you're a 65-year-old Caucasian female, you're not heavy, you're, you're really an at-risk population here. We try to identify those people and get them screened. Thank you. Certainly. Yes, sir. If you're on uh, blood thinners and, and you can't come off of them. Mm -hmm. uh, previously, I've been told by the by knee specialists they can't do nothing because I can't come off the blood thinners. Is that the same way with this type of system? That part, that part should be the same. Now, it depends what you're on blood thinners for and for how long. And we certainly encounter this with people that have AFib or they have mechanical heart valves or previous stents or things like that. And usually we get some guidance from cardiologist, vascular surgeon, whoever else is involved because they'll have a couple different ways they do that. Sometimes they'll say, okay, you can stop this for three days, you go right back on it after surgery. Sometimes they'll say, you can stop this medication that you're on, but we're gonna do Lovenox or some type of injectable short-acting medicine for a few days, turn it off 12 hours before surgery, turn it back on 12 hours after kind of thing. So there's some different ways that, uh, that they manage that. Next question, I'm sorry. Oh, two in the back. I 
I'm a heart and a diabetic, <clears throat> I understand I can't be put under. Do you do epidurals? Uh, I don't. Our anesthesiologists do. And we have a lot of people that do have spinal anesthesia. Uh, not, uh, not uncommon at all. And it'll vary a little bit from hospital or surgery center. Some places do a lot of general for total joints. Some places do almost exclusively spinal. But Sure. No, I, I have patients do it both ways. Sometimes it's patient preference. Sometimes it's a medical issue. Uh, I just let them talk with the anesthesiologist and whatever's best and safest. But we do that. We do nerve blocks and other treatments on everybody for, for pain control and to just try to minimize the amount of narcotics and the amount of anesthesia that you have to have as well. Do you hear what's going on when it goes that way? <laughs> <laughs> No. Uh, I don't want to hear it. it. It's a good question. Um, they're going to give you something for sedation. So general anesthesia, you're completely asleep. They're using a tube to breathe for you. With a spinal, they give you enough to kind of keep you asleep and, and twilighty, if you will, but you're breathing on your own. My rule is that you're not allowed to talk to me or try to help with the surgery. <laughs> and so whatever they, whatever they sort out beyond that is fine. Two in the back. After having a knee replacement um, and still having pain, went back to the orthopedic surgeon and, and a second doctor, both took x-rays, said it's sitting in there just fine. But would, if it were too big, would that show up on an x-ray? It, it can. And so some of that, when you have a conventional implant, is subjective. And I'll tell you that evaluating a painful total knee replacement a lot of times can be difficult. Now, sometimes you look at an x-ray, you talk to the patient, there's an implant that's loose, it's really grossly too big, something is obviously wrong, and I say, yes, I know you don't want another surgery, but I'm pretty sure we can make you better if we do that. Now, other things can be really subtle to diagnose, even just some rotation of an implant a few degrees can make it very painful for the soft tissues. Sometimes you have a great looking x-ray, but the knee's unstable. There are there's been an issue with some devices over the last couple of years debonding from the bone cement. I fortunately never did any of them, but there were a lot done. I revised one of them a week ago. She had had it done two years ago, had pain. It was a beautiful looking x-ray. Size was great. Everything about it looked good. I know the surgeon that did it, he's a good surgeon, and I went in and lifted the tibial implant right up out of the cement where it was loose and couldn't tell a thing with it on x-ray beforehand. So it's trying to, to solve that puzzle beforehand before you go back for other surgery. Sometimes nerve pain, I send folks that, you know, think they're having a problem with surgery that have just had some residual nerve pain and we've got some interventional pain doctors that do nerve blocks around them and I've had patients just come back and hug me. I mean they think it's just the greatest thing ever and there wasn't necessarily a mechanical problem it was a, a nerve pain problem after a knee replacement so it it just depends. Do you have nerve pain even three years later? Absolutely okay. especially if it's never gotten better. Yes, sir. What country makes the knee in a box? The USA. <laughs> this one. Uh, they're made in Boston and, and shipped here. Uh, so the CT scan and everything is done locally and that disappears into the internet and they magically make the knee and it ships down from Boston. Is there a time that you have to wait on it, Dr. Barber? Six weeks. Is it more costly? That's one of the myths. I've already, I've got that in here for later. No, it's not. Uh, surgeon gets paid the same, hospital gets paid the same, uh, all, all the costs are the same. Um, 
from an insurance standpoint, a knee replacement is a knee replacement is a knee replacement. Have occasionally had some pushback on CT scans ahead of time. We've got some ways to work around that. All right, y'all got good questions already. So some common myths around knee replacement. One is that we're replacing the whole knee. I think because it's called a knee replacement, it makes sense, right? Well, I don't know if anybody can see this, but this image on the left, I think this is what a lot of people think happens, that we're just taking out this massive amount of bone, we're putting in a giant hinge device and replacing their whole knee. We can do that, that's one of my x-rays, that's from very, very complex revision situations. Here's a primary custom knee. You can see, especially on the side view, this is all the patient's bone. We're just resurfacing the joint, getting rid of those worn out surfaces where the cartilage is gone and resurfacing that with metal and plastic. So less invasive than a lot of people think. I kind of threw this in. Even though I'm sitting here talking to you about one, one particular implant, it's just one of several factors. Who the patient is, what their health is like, what kind of shape they're in, who the surgeon is. I kind of talked about that at the beginning. We've got all these different things that play into getting a great outcome. Surgical techniques, what type of incision. So I think some people think if I can just Google this enough, I can get down to this one thing and if I have that, I'm guaranteed a good outcome. But it's really a combination of you working hard, working with your surgeon, finding somebody that you can work with, and in some cases, you know, having a, having a great implant that can help facilitate that. Somebody got this one already. No, no increased cost to the patient, so that one's, that one's busted. So the other one is that every patient needs a total knee replacement. You know, I, I do this surgery several hundred times a year. It's real easy to get fixated on that. But some patients do well without it. Um, some might just need a partial knee replacement, like you see on the left, where we just resurface one portion of the knee. And some may do really well just with injections or braces or physical therapy. We're always going to try these non-surgical treatments before proceeding to a, a full replacement. How long does it take for recovery? <laughs> That's kind of, you went right into it here. I think a lot of people think that they're going to be laid up for a really long time, not able to do stuff, not able to get back to their life. A key point here is that everybody recovers differently. And I'll go to the next one just because I think it's a video and it takes a little while to, to load up. So this is one of our folks, two weeks. Custom total knee replacement. This was her second one. She had done the other one, but no cane, no walker. That's Rick at eight weeks. He actually taught me Taekwondo when I was like nine. And uh, this is Mike. He's one of the respiratory therapists at the hospital. That's the morning after surgery right there. That's a little uncommon. You know, it was remarkable enough that I had to take a picture, but a lot of people get up and are back and moving and doing a lot quicker than they, they think they will be. I think you have to keep in mind that with the right knee, it may be a month or so before you can drive. That part slows you down a little bit. This is Jeff. He was one of the first people where I, as I started doing some of these custom implants, I was just taken aback by how, how quickly he was getting better. And I said, uh, I need to video you, man. Hold on here. You can see his cane's still in the room there, but he's really not using it. And we're seeing some of these, these really quick recoveries, people getting back to function and back to what they want to do. Um, you know, by six weeks, most everybody's off a of cane, getting around well. I think most people that have had it will tell you for the first three months or so, it's pretty sore, just tender in the, the soft tissues around it maybe tougher to sleep, um, and heals and matures for a year to even 18 months after surgery. So it really does uh, take a while. 
but uh, certainly folks getting up and going quicker than they ever have. And if you're in shape for it, we'll, we'll put you to work and, and get you moving with it. So. And that's the yes, ma'am. I had my first knee in 2011, and the therapy was tr tremendous. Is it the same type of therapy as far as, you know, is it the same degree or the same type? Not, not knowing specifically what you had, I would say yes, generally. Um, I have one is I do start therapy preoperatively. And most of the time, that's not something where you've got to go to a therapist office over and over, but I get anywhere between one and three visits in and they set up a home exercise protocol. We know for sure that the stronger and the more flexible you are going into surgery, the better you're going to do afterwards. And then afterwards, it's just kind of based on what you need, you know, how you're recovering. I have had a couple people with, uh, with this type of implant that were required a little less therapy, but uh, it just varies per individual. And I think that's it. Um, you can email us if you've got questions uh, that you don't want to ask in front of everybody. Thank you all uh, for having us. We greatly appreciate it.